introduction. It gives me my uh, great pleasure now to introduce a, a friend of mine and uh, um, someone who uh, is a huge, huge, huge influence on all of us in this community. I'm going to actually read you his bio because you don't know him like I know him. Um, Con Congressman Elijah Cummings was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland where he still resides today. As a matter of fact, he's right here in front of me. He obtained his uh, bachelor's degree in political science from Howard University. Yeah, go Howard. Uh, serving as student government president and graduating Phi Beta Kappa. I wouldn't have thought anything less from you. And then graduated from the University of Maryland School of Law. Uh, Congressman Cummings also uh, received 11 honorary doctorate degrees, so far that is. Um, He's dedicated his life uh, to the service of uplifting and empowering the people he has sworn to represent. He began his career of public service in the Maryland House of Delegates, where he served for 14 years and became the first African American in Maryland history to be named Speaker Pro Tem. Go. Um, since 1996, Congressman Cummings has proudly represented Maryland's 7th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, he currently serves as the ranking member of the Committee on Oversight. And the thing you need to know about um, this wonderful individual is that he has served tirelessly for, um, to, to really try to create a society where injustice is not present. He advocates for um, all the underserved, particularly working on education. He's a huge supporter of our ORCIDS program, and he's absolutely a model citizen and one of my heroes. Please welcome Elijah Cummings. Thank you, Maestra. It is indeed my honor and my privilege to be here, and I want to thank you, Southsop, for your leadership. When I was watching the, the uh, film, tears began to well up in my eyes. I'm a man who don't mind telling people I cry. And, you know, it is amazing, I was, as I was sitting there, I, was, I couldn't help but think about all the things that our orchestra here has done to make sure that when children hear the words orchestra and symphony, they realize that it's, no, it's not some foreign country or entity. And I want to thank you for your leadership. I really mean that. You have placed your fingerprints on generations yet unborn to make a difference. Give her a hand, please. I came by here, this is the first time in my 34 years of public service where I asked to come and speak somewhere. I just left uh, a gathering with President Clinton and we are in the middle of, I don't know if you know this, but uh, we are in the middle of dealing with something called Benghazi. I'm the top Democrat on that committee. I'm also the top Democrat on the drafting of the Democratic committee platform. But when I was leaving President Clinton a few minutes ago, before he even had a chance to speak, he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to meet with some orchestra people. And in typical Clinton style, he said, what's up with that? 
And what I told him was I wanted to come by because this wonderful organization had decided that it would have a conference around and would look at the whole issue of how to make sure that all of our children, all of our people were a part of what they do. Ladies and gentlemen, I have come by here to tell you what you already know, that our diversity is not our problem, it is our promise. A few days ago, I was at Marin's house where we were trying to raise some money for orchids. And there are moments in your life that cause you to reflect back on other significant moments of your life. Anybody been there? And isn't it amazing that you can, a lot of times when you hear an old song or you hear a speech or whatever, and you go back and you think about how you felt 50 years ago or 30 years ago, you can gin up the same feelings. And as I sat there and I listened to the maestra and others, I could not help but think about myself as a little boy in this city. A little boy some 50 some years ago Grew up not too far from here. Literally, you could have walked to my house in five minutes from where we're sitting right here. In a segregated city, growing up with two wonderful parents, neither one of whom had more than a third grade education. And my father, and mother had come to Baltimore from South Carolina when they got married at 18. And they came to Baltimore from South Carolina for one reason, because they wanted to make sure that their children had a chance to get an education that they did not have a chance to get. And they did it, they moved before we were even born. But I will never forget my father struggling with seven children. All I wanted to do was be in the band. There was a street band that would go up and down the street on the 4th of July and Memorial Day. And all the major holidays and I would watch them from the side and I was so excited and I wanted, when the time came, I just wanted to be in the band. But being in the band, you had to rent your horn for 35 cents a year. And my father didn't have it. And so I remember standing on the sidelines I can still remember the tune that they seemed to play over and over again. It went something like this, because they did the same thing over and over. And I just wanted to be able to be in the band. And I, and, and so, so for all these years, I've been wanting to be in the band. And when I was sitting there listening to people talk about raising money so that little children could have the opportunity that I, that I did not have, and so that they would not have to mourn what could have been. 
What could have been? Never know, I could have been up there in that orchestra myself. <laughs> the maestro would be pointing at me, giving me a solo. <laughs> and so, Orchids and so many other types of programs are so important. The arts are so important. I never got my horn. <laughs> you didn't hear that. She, the maestro said, I'm going to get it. Thank you. But let me just tell you something. Ladies and gentlemen, in so many of our cities, as I watched the film, I could not help but think about I live in that neighborhood. I live there. I have lived there for 35 years. And over and over again, I see young people who simply want to belong to something. They simply want to belong. And, and a lot of times in the neighborhoods, in many neighborhoods like those that you saw on the screen, people don't even know what, children don't even know what normal is. For so many of you, you take it for granted that your child will learn an instrument or will have a music teacher. Will have a mu hello, will have a music teacher. Will be able to visit the orchestra, I mean the symphony. First time I ever went to a symphony, I was 25 years old. And that was because I was trying to date Amen. <laughs> and so, I beg you, I would come asking, but I come begging. You to do what you are doing in this conference. Putting a spotlight on incorporating all of us in what you do and making sure that all folks, everybody, has an opportunity to be a part. Tell you two last things and then I'm gonna go. During the disturbances, I made it my business to try to keep people calm because I realized that if anybody, if there was one shot fired in Baltimore, that the whole city might blow up. And so I would be in Washington casting votes, and then I would rush home by nine o'clock so that I could get on the corner of Penn and North to encourage people to go home before the curfew, encourage the police not to act in a, in, a, in a negative way and trying to get cooperation. But I should never forget one night, the first night that I arrived on that corner, I dashed from, from D.C., went to the corner, and there was a fella on the corner who I knew. He was, he, he was, and I, my, I had a theory, well, you had all these people in the corner, a lot of them wanted to get arrested. And I wanted to make sure they didn't. But I had a theory that if I went to the person who was making the most noise and seemed to be the leader, that that might be a, the best way of helping calm the situation. And so this one particular night I went to the corner and this guy, he was cursing and jumping up and down and I mean, he was so angry, he was just really upset. And I knew him because he, he was one of the guys in my neighborhood. You know, and, 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 and all my, before I left Washington, I saw him on CNN. <laughs> so I got here and I went up to him and I said, you know, I asked him what he was going to do. Man, Mr. Cummins, I'm getting arrested tonight, man. I, I got to, I mean, and he was saying, cursing and everything. And I said, you know, but, but, but don't, don't you have children? He said, yeah, I have two children. 
I said, how old are your children, two and five? I said, well, who's going to take care of your children if you're in jail? He said, well, my baby's mama, uh, she's going to take care of them until uh, 9.30. I said, well, if you get arrested at 10, who's going to take care of them? Second lady cursed and cursed and cursed and cursed. And then I did something. My spirit told me, put your arms around them. I put my arms around him and I said, I love you. And he backed off from me and he said, as tears began to run down his face, he said, Mr. Cummins, you're the first man that ever told me he loved me. He said, I'm 25 years old. And then, Maestra, this is where the arts came in. My spirit said, and he was still a little belligerent, so as we began to try to get people off the corner, my spirit said, it's time for some music. And I began to sing this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. And I'm trying to march people off the corner. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. As you can see, I'm not the greatest singer. But next thing I knew, I looked over, and there he was. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And he became a part of the leadership. Why? For two things. I showed him respect. I saw him as a human being who had phenomenal potential. And every night after that, he came five nights in a row and came up to me and said, uh, Congressman Cummings, reporting for duty. <laughs> reporting for duty. You may not think what you're doing is significant, but it is significant. It was a teacher who told me in the eighth grade, who Rudolf Nureyev was. In my neighborhood, Rudolf, who? Of course, he was a ballet guy, right? From Russia, right. And so I came to appreciate ballet because somebody came to my school when I was in the eighth grade and introduced us to Rudolf Nureyev. But I can tell you, in my neighborhood, most people don't know who he is, 99%. But again, it became a part of who I am. It allowed me to be able to appreciate the arts. Remember what I said in some neighborhoods, Folk don't even know what normal is. In the sixth grade, we had a wonderful teacher who took us to a place not far from here called Sherwood Gardens. I didn't even know it was, it, it, it was that many beautiful flowers in the world, but somebody took an interest in me and they realized that we needed to be exposed to these wonderful things in the world. And that's why when I visited Orchids and watched those little kids talk about their composers that I had never heard of, talked about how they loved it and how it made them feel, it simply reminded me of when my daughter went to the School for the Arts here in Baltimore. She came home one day, I'm closing now, she came home one day and she said, Daddy, I got something to tell you. And every parent in here knows that you hate to think that your child don't like the school. She came and she said, Daddy, I just got something to tell you. She put, she put her head down. She said, Daddy, this is the most wonderful thing. This school is the most wonderful thing that has ever happened to me. I said, why is that? She said, I always knew that there was a part of me 
that was like right up here, daddy. But I couldn't get it out. And now I'm in this school and I'm able to let it out. And it makes me feel so much better about myself. And so she just graduated. I, I knew there some Howard people in the room. She just graduated from Howard University about two weeks ago. Doing fine. As I close, I just wanted to come by and emphasize to you how important what you do is. As I march towards the twilight of my life, there's nothing more important to me than seeing children have opportunities, seeing them be exposed to the world, giving them a chance to know what normal is. It reminds me of my mother-in-law who had breast cancer. She died in September. She was one of the most brilliant human beings I ever met. And I consider her one of my best friends. She produced three of the most brilliant children that I've ever met. And she was a former teacher. And they, her name was Hazel. So Hazel had been sick for about three months. I'm almost finished. You're looking a little nervous. <laughs> See, in my neighborhood, you don't miss a, you don't miss a fly. <laughs> I, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> so there Hazel is, knowing that she's about to die. And she called a meeting. Said, I just want to meet with the family. And I was hoping that for that moment, she wouldn't include me. She said, you got to be in here. And they began to talk about her funeral. That's what she wanted to meet about. And Maestra, as she began to talk about her funeral, the first thing she said is, I don't want a funeral. So I don't want a funeral. She said, I want a memorial service. And we said, but, but wait a minute, hold on. You've been the head of the NAACP. You've been the head of the Democratic Party. You've been in your county. You've been, uh, you've been a teacher. You've been a GI counselor. I mean, come on. You gotta, you've been a substitute teacher. You've done all these wonderful things. People will want to come. She said, no, I don't want a funeral. I said, why, mother? Why don't you want a funeral? She said, I don't want you spending money on no limousine. I raised y'all so y'all could got, all y'all got a car? You drive your own car. <laughs> <laughs> she said, all I want you to do is get me the cheapest casket that you can find and bury me graveside. You can have a memorial service you want, she said, I would prefer, I would like to be cremated, but I think it would be, because I think it would be cheaper, but that's too close to hell. I don't think I want to. <laughs> but we asked the question, why, mother? Why? She said, because I want you to take that money. And she said, tell them not to send me any flowers. This former teacher, counselor of GIs after they got back from war, sat there and sat, sat up in her bed and said, I want you to establish a scholarship fund so the children who cannot afford to go to college can have that opportunity. So ladies and gentlemen, what she was doing was creating a path for people to get, and young people, to get to a brighter future. And the reason why I left Bill Clinton, the reason why I put down my duties for a moment in addressing the platform for the Democratic Party, the reason why I put aside the Benghazi Committee is because I wanted to come here 
to first of all thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. I came here at number two to make you realize how significant it is. Number three, I came here simply to encourage you, to encourage you to continue to do what you are doing. May God bless. So let's acknowledge the obvious. Um, there's nothing I can say to follow that. This should be the end of the conference. Um, but it's not. And um, we, ha we, ha we have a musical way of explaining where we are at this moment. And that is, uh, think about a coda. And uh, we just heard an end and a great inspiration and a heart-throbbing experience. And um, codas, though, are not something that just kind of dangles at the, at the end. They are ways that we kind of look back on all that's come before and sometimes bring some, some new, new light onto what we've heard and some new perspective. And so with that musical metaphor, we're about to transition into the, the next piece of our, our conference. And um, my notes say this is the capstone of the conference. Let's call it the coda of the conference. We'll feature a forum based on identifying key actions that orchestras can take individually and collectively to help our institutions and art form become more responsive to and reflective of the diversity and dynamism of the 21st century. We'll hear from a remarkable civil rights activist as well as a senior leader within the US Department of Education about the context and systems that dramatically shape efforts to increase diversity, inclusion, and equity. Their remarks will be followed by a dynamic panel discussion with four members of our orchestral community deeply committed to enhancing orchestra's relevance to the broadest possible public. And to lead us through uh, this discussion, we are happy to bring back uh, to our stage Jamie Bennett. So Jamie, take it away. So thank you very much, Jesse. Um, as Jesse teed up, and I think the congressman uh, very powerfully ushered in, we've spent two and a half days, three days, talking among ourselves about our work as orchestras, what we need to do, where we're going to go tomorrow. And I think this coda, as Jesse invoked it, is really meant to be a reminder that there are some pretty powerful forces that shape the world that our orchestras exist in. And there are some pretty powerful allies in the work that we have ahead of us. So for this coda, for this last session, we have two presentations, and then following that, we have a panel that's gonna discuss and bring out some of those issues. So to bring us in, um, please join me in welcoming to the stage an organizer, activist, and educator whose work focuses on the issues of justice, equity, and innovation, as well as someone who's been very powerfully at work here in Baltimore and across the country. Please join me in making feel welcome to Ray McKesson. On August 16th, 2014, I was sitting on my couch in Minneapolis and I saw on the news what was happening in Ferguson. And I saw on Twitter what was happening and there was real dissonance. So I said, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go for the weekend just to see, to bear witness. I didn't go in the beginning as a protester, I went as someone who just wanted to know what was true. And I went, and I'll never forget the second day that I was in St. Louis was the first night of the curfew. If you remember the curfew back in those early days, and it was the first night that I got tear gassed. And it was in that moment that I said, I'm a protester. It was, it was in being hit with two canisters of tear gas and running through them that I said, people shouldn't have to live in a world that looks like this. And I spent my career in education. I spent my career making sure that kids had great teachers in every classroom every day, both here in Baltimore and in Minneapolis. 
But I had this moment where it was like, you got to be alive to learn. That I'm doing all this work to make sure that every kid has a great teacher, but it won't matter for, for Mike Brown or Tamir Rice or Anna Jones or Rakia Boyd. And when I think about the last 20 months, I'm mindful that we have misunderstood what protest is. That protest at its root is this idea of telling the truth in public. And there's so many ways that we can do that. For us, we put our bodies in the street to tell the truth with our bodies that Mike should be alive, that Rakia should be alive, that Ayana should be alive, that we disrupted board meetings and commissions and hearings to tell the truth that they weren't using their institutional power in ways that honored the lives of black people or marginalized people. But we know that there are many ways for people to be truth tellers. And I've seen people in privileged spaces opt out of the movement or opt out of what it means to protest because they're like, I can't go in the street. And what we tell people is that the fight is where you are. The fight is always where you are. That you don't need to be in the street to push people, to push this world to be a more equitable place or to be a more just place. I will say that the last 20 months have been hard. It has been interesting to be further away from the 390 days that we stood in the street in St. Louis or to be further away from the protests here in Baltimore or in Charleston or San Francisco or so many other cities. Uh, and one of the things that's particularly hard about it is that we have both misremembered the past. Like people talk about Ferguson if it was like a, a weekend as opposed to like, you know, 390 days of people in the street. Um, but also because we are ever mindful of all of the people who now go all across the country talking about how important the movement is to them who did nothing in those initial days who watched us get beat, who watched us get tear gas and stay home, stayed silent. And I say that not to shame any of you or to shame anyone who stood by, but just to ask people to think about what stopped them from acting so when the next thing comes up, they might make a different choice. Of all the things that I've learned in the movement, there's so many, but one is this idea that hope is a belief that our today's can be better than our, to that our tomorrow's can be better than our today's. The second is that there are more people who wanna do good work than know what to do and that our work as organizers to help people think about what are the concrete things they can do to make the world better. And that we aren't born woke, but something wakes us up. That there's so many people who just didn't know that police violence was an issue. There's so many people who had not thought about diversity or equity. And there's so many people who need that spark, that conversation, that thing to get them to think about the world differently. And that leads me to the conversation today is that people often talk about us as people who are on the front lines and we, because we were in the street. And what I tell people is that you are often on the front lines in the community that you're in too, that you have proximity to the work. And the language of the front lines is often about proximity. How close are you willing to be to the work in the community that you say you stand with? And when we think about uh, what you have to do as leaders is that you have to be close to the work. That if you say that you care about diversity, you care about impoverished communities or marginalized communities, you have to make a commitment to be in those communities, to be near those communities, to be around them. When I think about my work as a teacher or someone who opened up after school programs, like I had to be in communities to understand that. When I think about you as people who lead orchestras, if you say that you have a commitment to marginalized communities, if you are in nowhere near those communities or know anyone in them, that is not living that commitment. When we think about storytelling, I think one of the most powerful things about the movement, you know, we know that we did not invent resistance. We know we didn't discover injustice in August of 2014, that we exist in a legacy of struggle. We know that to be true. What we had, though, were different tools, and we were able to use social media in ways that allowed us to tell stories differently. And we know that stories inform the way that people think about the world, that ideas, that the battleground is often a battleground of ideas, that for us, the battleground was about safety. We're helping people understand that what it meant to be safe was not just a matter of policing. That if I ask you where you feel the most safe in the world, it's probably not in a room full of police. It's probably in a room where people love you, where there's food and shelter, where people care. Like we are pushing people to imagine safety differently. And that was about telling stories because we know that the way people think about the world changes the way that they act in the world. And when I think about you, the questions that I have for you are about what stories do your actions and your decisions reinforce about the communities you say that you serve? Are you reinforcing a narrative that says that music by black artists only matters during Black History Month? Or are you making decisions that help people think about music and the, and the rich history of blackness beyond Black History Month? What do your actions and decisions tell us and tell the world about how you understand diversity? Are you one of those people who says that there simply are no people of color out there who are musically inclined? Or are you someone who understands that a condition of racism in this country means that we have to work differently to find talent, but that the talent exists? 
Are you someone who uplifts programs like Soulful Symphony, which is here in the city? Uh, or are you someone who says that nobody's doing this work? Is it the way that we tell stories with our actions and our decisions changes the way that we act in the world? And when we think about classical music, it is often the question of sort of why does music matter? Why does art matter? We understand art to be both a mirror and a window. And we know that sometimes we have to do some cleanup on both of those things. That the mirror helps us think about who we are differently, helps us reflect and see ourselves in a deeper way. And the window helps us imagine what worlds can be. It helps us think about the future that we want to live in. And that art pushes the boundaries of those things. And the art community helps bring more people into what their gifts are. I think about in the movement, you know, the Beyonce concert was last night. If any of you were there, it was great. Uh, it was out late for Beyonce. Um, but we think about what she has done with her music to push people to think about the work differently. And that's what you get to do in your work too, is push people to think about the work differently, to think about the world differently, and to be in spaces where they are impacted and can understand their gifts. We know that the beginning of the work is often the truth-telling piece. It is often the hardest work. For us, we use our bodies to tell the truth about the world that we knew was unjust but could be better. And we find so many people won't have the honest conversations about the world that help us get to the truth-telling. We know that the truth-telling is not the end of the work, that it's the beginning. That in the movement space, at the beginning of the work is saying there is a problem, let us talk about it. And then it's about having real solutions. And then it's about institutionalizing the change. So that if all we do is talk about it, that that actually doesn't change the world. It changes people's hearts and minds, and that is important. But we have to actually change the systems and structures. I find myself quieter today than I used to be in August of 2014 in September when we were in the street night after night. Not because I'm not as passionate, but because I know that the, that the hard work of institutionalizing change often is also the quiet work. It is the work that happens at dinner tables. It's the, the work that happens in city council meetings. And we all have a role to play in that fight. So I tell people often, if you are not someone who can be in the street, if you know the governor, skip the street, call the governor that you can do the work wherever you are and you manage large organizations and institutions in cities across the country. And you have a responsibility to make sure that they reflect the diversity of the communities that you say you stand with and the rich tradition and history of music itself. It's an honor to be here and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. So I think everything DeRay said was extremely powerful. The, the one bit I want to ask everyone to hold especially in their minds is his question about what stops us from acting, right? That's a question I want you to hold as we go into the conversation. Now, um, adding to the knowledge in the room, adding to the power in the room, it is my honor to invite up the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy and Programs in the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education at the U.S. Department of Education and a South Bend, Indiana native, where I was on Wednesday. Uh, please join me in welcoming Monique Chisholm. Good afternoon. So I come from a tradition of call and response. So that means that I call and you respond. So good afternoon. Thank you, thank you very much. So I am gonna try to hold it together. I'm telling you, I am so um, just emotionally filled from our, our speakers this um, afternoon. And so I'm gonna do my best to hold it together, but if I don't, I know that you guys will be forgiving. So. Um, I just want to start off by saying a very heartfelt thank you to, um, to the organizers of the conference, but also to each and every one of you for being here today and taking time out of your busy schedules to engage in this conversation. And I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to spend a couple of minutes with you um, focusing on this. You know, when we think about arts and education, it's, it's easy to liken it to the novice teachers in our schools. Often when budgets have to be cut or resources are low, the arts are the first in and the last, and the, the first in and often the first out. So when times get tough, we often look towards cutting our arts programs first. I reject the notion that arts and history and foreign language and science and social studies and civics 
our add-on courses, our nice-to-have courses. We know that in our 21st century knowledge-based economy, that a well-rounded education is not a luxury, but it is a necessity, and the arts are an integral part of that well-rounded education. The arts are, in fact, very near and dear to my heart. I went to the School for the Creative and Performing Arts in Cincinnati, Ohio. Do we have any Ohioans here? Yes, OH. Um, and it was a, a wonderful experience. I have to kind of describe a little bit of the circumstance so you understand where I'm coming from a little bit. Uh, my family was a very middle class family. We lived in Iowa, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and my dad was the president of the NAACP. My mom was a bookkeeper. So we lived a very middle class life in, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. My parents then got divorced at the age of 12, and my sister, my mom, and I moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. For that first year, we lived with a friend of my mother's because we didn't have enough money to, to secure housing for ourselves. And, and then my sister, my mom, and I moved to um, a very, very impoverished community um, where it was mixed income public housing and also low rent housing. And it was the first time um, that I was really exposed to stark racism. Uh, coming from Iowa, uh, I wasn't very exposed to blatant racism. Going to Cincinnati, Ohio, I would have situations where the Ku Klux Klan was marching right in front of me. So my whole world shifted dramatically. Uh, if I had went to my neighborhood school, I would not be standing here in front of you today. It's what we would politely call a chronically underperforming school today or a dropout factory, but it certainly would not have produced the woman that you see before you. My mother fought for my sister and I to go to the School for the Creative and Performing Arts. We auditioned, and luckily we got in. And that school literally, when I say literally, changed my life. Um, it has shaped me into the person today and the experiences that I have still stand with me today. The school itself was in a much more impoverished community than I actually lived in. Um, so getting to school, I would travel through um, violence and drug dealers and total chaos, but that school was a safe haven for me and cultivated things that I didn't even know that were inside of me. So I have the great pleasure to serve as the Deputy Assistant Secretary now and carry the importance of arts integration and arts education with me in the work that I do today. We know for a fact that arts education makes a difference in improving student outcomes. I want to share some, some statistics with you from longitudinal studies where we just know that this is true and accurate. When we look at arts-engaged students, overall they have a higher GPA, especially for high school students. We also know that um, students who have an arts-engaged, arts-enriched experience enroll in colleges and competitive universities at a much higher rate. And for low-income students, we know that they are three times more likely to earn a bachelor's degree than students who are not exposed to an arts enriched ed education. So for a host of reasons, we know that a high quality arts education program is absolutely critical for providing students with a world class education. And an integrated arts can, ed education can significantly boost student achievement, reduce discipline problems, and also increase the odds that a student will go on to graduate from college. Arts educa education, as all of you know, is essential for stimulating creativity and innovation. And last but la not least, it's fun. Like, we have fun doing these things, right? And it's a way to keep our students engaged. It gives them a reason to come to school, to be excited about play practice, or the orchestra, or jazz band, and creative writing. And so we know that this is an important component of our well-rounded education. The National Center for Education and Statistics, um, part of the US Department of Education, has uh, conducted a national survey to look at arts and at arts access around the nation. And what we know is that about 1.3 million students, 1.3 million students in elementary school fail to get any exposure to, march, to music instruction. And the same is, is true for about 800,000 high school students. And there are nearly 4 million students across the nation who do not receive any visual arts instruction at all during their formative learning years. And unfortunately, when we start to look at this in terms of opportunity and access, 
we know that our students who live in high poverty areas are substantially disenfranchised from, these, from access to arts education. So the opportunity gap, and I phrase it in terms of an opportunity gap because that really does talk about the systemic things within a system, the inputs into a system that create inequality is a disproportionate response for our low-income students. I find this troubling for a number of reasons, but primarily because I just talked about the positive impact that arts education has on improving student outcomes. And yet, the dis despite the importance and what we all know about this, we know that we are falling fall short. We are falling short of this goal to make sure that every student has access. At the Department of Education, one of our primary goals is to focus on equity and access and to make sure that every su single student graduates from high school ready to either go to college, go into a career, and also be prepared to engage in their communities. The last time that I checked the Declaration of Independence, it talked about certain inalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I didn't see a clause or a footnote that said that this was only for the privileged. I didn't see a clause or a footnote that said that it was just for the elite. And I didn't see a clause or a footnote that said that it was just for students who won the education lottery. We know that the pursuit of happiness is non-existent without having a core foundational education that prepares you for success. We have a new law, which I'm very excited about, the Every Student Succeeds Act, and I am very encouraged and hopeful that this new law will help to galvanize our nation around the things that are important. You've heard Secretary Duncan and you've heard Secretary King and you've heard many people talk about education as the civil rights issue of our time. And I just saw an issue in Ed Week, I'm not sure if anyone saw this, but uh, go back and check it out, which was questioning whether this was a true statement or not. Could we really argue that education is a civil rights issue and that the Elementary and Secondary Education Act is a civil rights bill? I just had to stop and kind of pause and even kind of gas at the question itself. So I want us to stop and really think for a minute. DeRay and, and Congressman Cummings have given us a strong foundation to think about what that means to think about education as a civil rights issue, but I want to pause and ask you to think for yourself, what are you willing to do or what are you willing to sacrifice to make a well-rounded education a reality for each and every student? It's easy for us to speak the words and say every child deserves access to equity and opportunity regardless of race, disability, zip code, or family income. It is easy to say that we expect excellence from every child. However, for some reason, it is not easy to align our policies, our procedures, and our practices with these ideals. Even though we know millions of children across the nation are shut out of the system. So I want you to get, again consider, what would it really mean to ensure equity and access for all children? I think it involves a couple of things for me. First, it means identifying and acknowledging the policies that are bias. We know for sure that there are policies in place currently that allow access for some and exclude others. It would also mean identifying and acknowledging the attitudes, the dispositions, and the beliefs that lead to a culture of low expectations. I have been in many situations where I know that students are struggling with things at home, in their communities, um, have many obstacles to face. And I've seen very kind teachers say, I'm not going to expect as much from Jermaine because I know everything that he's experiencing at home. You have to do the exact opposite. You have to have high expectations with support in order to make sure that Jermaine can succeed in life. It also means that we would identify and acknowledge that we have consciously, and I want to say consciously disinvested in our most vulnerable communities, our urban, our rural, our tribal communities across the nation at the expense of the children that live in these communities. This is not by happenstance. This is a conscious decision. 
The Elementary and Secondary Education Act has provided a foundation for our nation's schools to help raise the bar for every child and to ensure that supplemental resources are there to help those most in need. It's helped to create the expectation that wherever you live in this country, people like you in this room will come together and work to make sure that change happens. But it is hard work. It's extremely hard work. It's uncomfortable. And you are probably going to lose some of your, your friends and allies in the process. If we truly believe that all children believe that all children deserve a well-rounded education, then our work becomes extraordinarily clear. I believe that it is our job as the adults in this system to do everything that we can to have honest and courageous conversations about inequality in our nation. If you're not comfortable talking about inequality, in particular race, gender, class, then you need to get comfortable because our children are depending on you. It also means that we will have to do more than just have the conversations. It means that those conversations are followed by action and that that would involve our young people, our teachers, our school leaders, our faith community, government, educators, in order to make sure that we are all working together towards the right solution. No matter where you might be in this continuum of adults that influence education outcomes, we must see ourselves as leaders in this space. I just want to emphasize that again, that sometimes we wait on a leader to show up and tell us what to do. But each and every one of us is a leader in the space that we exist. We have power and influence in the space that we exist in now. And we need to use that. We need to find ways to alter the outdated routines and processes that are not serving the purposes that we want to accomplish. Moving the conversation forward, followed by action, is going to take all of us to do it together. I want to just focus on helping us remember that we are stronger together. It's fine to have one voice at the table championing this issue, but it's better to have 10 and 20, 30. I think we have 300 people at this conference that can sing a chorus of what the change needs to be. We have the responsibility to trumpet the importance of integration of arts and education as a vehicle for improving educational outcomes, and we need to continue to beat that drum. I know that you are all working very hard and tirelessly in this effort, and I thank you for that. And I urge you to continue to fight and to provide for all of our children the well-rounded and rigorous education that they deserve. President Kennedy said, let the arts establish the basic human truths, which, we must, which must serve as the touchstone of our judgment. We also heard Congressman Cummings Cumming say today that our actions could possibly be the fingerprints on the generation to come. That's powerful, that what we do today can be the finger, fingerprints on the generations to come. And then we heard DeRay say that we must tell the truth in public. I leave you with that and ask you to join me in saving millions of lives across the nation to help expose them to arts and rich education. Thank you so much. All right, so Monique, thank you very much for that. And I'm thrilled that uh, DeRay and Monique are able to join us uh, back on stage. And we also have with us Ann Parsons, who is the president and CEO of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, uh, Gail Rose, who is the board chair of the Memphis Symphony, Alex Lang is back with us, principal clarinetist from the Phoenix Symphony, and Marin Alsop, our host and music director of the Baltimore Symphony. So we've got about 35, 40 minutes to, to sort of be a capstone, be a coda, have the conversation um, that we've been teeing up for the last two and a half days. And I think after the, after the presentations, the three words that I think are really sitting with me are urgency, our power, and our leadership. And so I'd like to begin with um, Alex and Marin and revisit a question that we began 
the, the conference with. You both look terrified, don't they? <laughs> um, is there an urgent need for us to change? It's a very simple question. And I think it's the question that we need to be asking ourselves as we walk out. So Marin, as a music director, as an artist, is there an urgent need for us to change issues around race, ethnicity, and gender within the symphony orchestra world? Well, I think uh, you know there's an urgent need for us to change in society, and the symphony orchestra is just a microcosm of the broader society. I mean, I, I believe that we all have responsibilities to be agents of change within what we do, but I think we have bigger responsibilities as citizens of the world to change the broader society and, and, and get out there and just and just be part of. And, and as DeRay said, you know, just tell the truth about what's going on. Thank you. Alex, same question. Where are you on the question of urgency walking out of our three days together? Yeah, I think I'm um, I think more willing to, to share the level at which I feel that urgency, which is a personal one, right? So I urgently feel uh, very often in my organization and on my stage that there needs to be more black people. So I think that... Uh, You're gonna say it now. Yeah, yeah. I think also that um, uh, Maestro Alsop is right, that this is a reflection of our larger society. And the reason that I think that we need to have um, more voices in the room is that I'm interested in the reimagining of what a symphony orchestra can be. And I want these voices in the room so that reimagining is more rich and is more vibrant and is more interesting and is more relevant. Now, um, Gail and Ann, I know where you both stand on the issue of urgency because we prepared for this. So I'm not going to ask you that question. I want you to speak as a board chair, and I want you to speak as a president and a CEO. Your two positions hold a lot of the power in the orchestra world. Your two positions shape what happens, maybe to a lesser degree on our stages, but certainly everything that happens other than what happens on the stage at 7.30. The two of you don't necessarily look like most president and CEOs in the symphony orchestra world and most board chairs, right? I tend to look like more people in the symphony orchestra world. So talk about power and leadership and talk about who needs to own and lead this change that we feel an urgent need. I'm gonna put Anne on the spot first just because you're closer. That's fine. Uh, thank you, thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation because I do think it's vital and, um, and urgent as you, as you said, you know that. Um, uh, our job is, as was said today, so clearly to move the conversation forward and turn the conversation, first of all, make sure the conversation is honest, open, transparent, direct, respectful. Um, honesty is about digging deep underneath the question, asking questions, listening, asking more questions, listening again, having conversations about what we've heard, and then collectively deciding how we can move forward. So leaders, I don't think about our power as much as our authority. We talked about this uh, this week, actually, the difference between leadership and authority and how you marry the two. And so using our authority, our platforms of authority, it's our job to ask the right questions. Who are we? What do we do? How do we do it? And why does it matter? Every single day, we should be asking ourselves these questions in our institutions to be better and to lift ourselves up and to lift others up. Why are we here? Not for ourselves, we're here for others. We're here in service. And so if we ask ourselves these questions around any topic, but particularly around this topic of who we serve, we will propel things forward. We will make sure things change and we will put one foot in front of the other. There will be sprints and there will be marathons. We have to understand, as was said earlier, that this is a marathon. Change does not happen overnight in most cases. So there are things you can change, however, from today to tomorrow, from this hour to the next. I don't think anyone here can leave this room without feeling changed. And that's a good thing. It's really powerful. And the, the one metaphor I want to pick up in that is a lot of us are very comfortable talking about the fact that change is a marathon. Right? A lot of us are very comfortable about pointing to what we need to change in the pipeline 
And I just want to caution us that a marathon needs to begin and that those two things cannot be excuses to say this is a problem we'll get to in 20 years. Because I worked at the New York Philharmonic in 1994 and we were having many of these same pipeline conversations and we knew it was going to take 20 years to fix and it's been more than 20 years. And the numbers have moved from 1.4% to 1.8%, from 1.2% to 1.6%. Um, Gail, you talked a little bit about coming on as a board chair in Memphis. Yeah. And I think in some ways, to totally mischaracterize what happened, um, people thought they were bringing on a caretaker. You were sort of invited on to come and be board chair for a year and just get us through. And what I don't think they realized they were getting was a change maker. Yeah. So you came in into a leadership role in this organization, and you had to lead some pretty significant change on every level what people were involved in making the decisions, what the structure of the orchestra was going to look like, was there going to be a financially viable future. Talk about how you had to deal with and wrestle issues of power, issues of privilege, in order to be a change maker. Well, um, most people in the room know that Memphis has been through a crisis of, of the orchestra itself in the past couple seasons. And I was invited in in 2012, like you said, to really raise money. Um, that's what the orchestra thought they needed. Um, and I haven't expressed my deep gratitude to you, Jesse, to the, to the league, and to be sitting on this panel with some of my heroes. And um, it, it, it is like, for me, the, my worlds are coming together in this leadership of the Memphis Symphony, which, if you knew me in Memphis, would not have seen me in this role. Um, last Thursday, I was marching from Foot Homes to Booker T. Washington High School on National Gun Violence Day. If you're my friend on Facebook, you saw me in that mix of a crowd of maybe three white people amongst about 200 African Americans. So I don't suffer from fear of getting in the middle of the people that we want to serve. I think a lot of people, when they asked me to come to lead the symphony, were hoping that I would go get the money and maybe not be uh, in, in, try to invoke some of the change that we're, that we're attempting to make in Memphis. But um, when I came into the room and I looked and I saw literally all Caucasians in the room, I said, this is it, or this is a problem. Memphis, let me just tell you, Memphis is 63% African-American. This year, we have surpassed Chicago in our homicide rate per capita. 30% of our community lives in poverty. 47% of our children live in poverty. How is the Memphis Symphony going to react when we had one African-American on our board zero on our staff, two on the stage. And, and it just didn't make sense. So, also, I think what you've said about leadership and authority is very, very powerful because leadership in today means change. Authority is what you've given the container to make change, but leadership is about how you, how you pace change. In, in a manner in which people can tolerate, but yet also helps them become uncomfortable. So today, um, we have, my goal is, um, was in two years to have 40% African American uh, representation on our board. I say African American because we, in our diverse, uh, we're pretty black and white in Memphis. There is a stronger and growing Latino community um, and other ethnic and ethnicities, but it's primarily a, a predominantly African-American community. So right now we have 24% uh, African-American representation on our board, and that's within one year. Um, and it is um, primarily due to the networks of, and the um, uh, relationships that we've created over the years um, in the African-American community. That's right, so a little more than halfway there. Yes. 24% against 40%. Um, DeRay, I want to come back to, to your powerful definition of protest as truth-telling, and therefore truth-telling as protest. 
Um, but many times when I've seen major structural change happen, we've needed people inside the system to be change agents like Gail, and we've needed people outside the system demanding the change. And we've seen that work to different degrees of effectiveness with the system of public education in this country. We've seen it with the integration of the armed forces. We've seen it in various major things. There aren't folks that are currently storming the barricades of the symphony orchestras. We're worried about it. It is extraordinary that Congressman Cummings came up. It is extraordinary that you joined us. But there isn't a lot of non-orchestra people demanding the change and creating the urgency. Can you talk a little bit about sort of inside the system, outside the system, how can we create a sense of urgency? How can we create a fire so that there actually is action? Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so three things. One, I think that there is a, when I think about this idea of protest is telling the truth in public, it's really, you can tell the truth anywhere, right? So whether you're inside, outside, dinner table, boardroom, that like the truth telling work, the context doesn't matter as much, like you have to do the work anywhere. I do think there's a real question about uh, change with, which rests on this understanding that we have to be as organized on the inside as we are on the outside, that that has to be a part of the work. I think about the third thing is I would push you and say that people are, people are voting with their feet and with their dollars about the, the orchestra, right? Like they're not coming because they don't see people that look like them or, or they don't hear music that reflects a tradition that they understand, right? Like I think that people are actually making choices. And then it's like, what's the response to that? What I worry about, especially in the last 20 months, now that there's a national conversation about race happening across the country um, in all sectors, is that you know, we sit in the street to bring attention to a crisis that people wouldn't talk about. But the issue of diversity, people have been talking about it forever, right? And the absence of people doing things, they just repeat the problem. So like we just, we all sort of pat ourselves on the back about like who understands the problem the best, um, which like happens over and over. And then the public work around what solutions look like is actually what doesn't happen. So we think about, I think about with, with orchestras, uh, some of you run seemingly blind selection processes that are blind until they're not, right? Mm -hmm. And then at the end, there is a real question about how do you see and hear race? Because like you are seeing and hearing race when the screen comes off. And like, what, how, is your, how are you institutionally dealing with that? Like, I think that so many of the solutions and so much of the solution work is actually like the nitty gritty, the forms that people fill out. It's like the selection process, it's the, recruitment materials that don't have anybody that look like anybody that might look like me, right? Like all of that actually impacts the way that people think about your commitment to equity and, and justice, which is different than like people hearing you talk about it over and over. And I do think that uh, in so many spaces, so this is not a critique of this space, you know, I definitely think about it in the social justice sort of criminal justice space, is that people, there's like this addiction to talking about the problem in ways that don't actually help us talk about what solutions look like. Thank you for that. Yeah. Monique, you talked about, um, I think it was an opportunity agenda, an opportunity framework within the Department of Education's work, and Congressman Cummings reframed diversity not as a problem, but as a promise. And so I want to take a minute for this room just to sit with the concept of deficit-based language, right? And I want us as a community to think about the invitations we extend. So when an orchestra builds a program that's targeting at-risk youth, when an orchestra builds a program that's targeting minority youth, when an orchestra builds a program that's, that's targeting underserved youth, it's very clear who has the value in that formation, right? The orchestra has the value and is going to impart it to this poor underserved community, this broken community. That's not a very welcoming invitation. That's not a chance of saying we in the orchestra world are missing something and you who are not in the orchestra world has it. Can we please come together and find it? So can you talk a little bit about, I mean, we're in a, a, we're in a conversation, I think a national conversation around parsing language, right? And we're so careful with our language. But I think some language really powerfully matters. And so would you just talk about sort of opportunities and deficits and how we actually invite folks in and what happens to a system when we're only engaging with 60% of the population and a diminishing amount? Small yes. question. <laughs> no, thank you for the question. That's a great question. I think I want to start off by first saying that um, I, being here and staying here for the conversation already you know, communicates the value that you place on this conversation. So I want to say that first off. 
And I think that what happens sometimes is that very well-intentioned people get paralyzed in trying to understand what to do. And so what happens is that we have an awareness about the problem in the situation, but we don't know how we personally can do anything to change it. Just a quick story. I, I just picked my friend up from the airport on my way here. They're at the aquarium right now. And her son, six years old, uh, said, "Man, Mom, Mommy, there's a man laying in the street. And she said, yes, honey, he's probably homeless. And in that space and in that time, I'm like, how do we normalize people living on the street in America? But in that space and time of me trying to get to this event and drop them off so that they have um, their activities this afternoon, how do I intersect in that space? So I say that just to say that I don't think that anyone in this room is a bad person, but we sometimes get paralyzed in the space that we are and not knowing how to address it. And so what I would say is that you have to start to meet people where they are. So it's very important for kids to come into the orchestra hall. It's very important for them to have that experience. But it's also important for you to go into their communities and have the experience that they, their lived experiences and really value what they have to teach and learn and offer and give. And so that we're, we're merging the opportunities for growth for everyone around. So it's not just us filling up people who we, we categorize as underserved or in, at needs or at risk, but it's also us seeing that as a learning opportunity for ourselves that will help to fulfill and enrich our lives. And it also means stopping and taking that extra second when you see injustice or you see inequity to address it in the moment. Yeah. That might be a colleague saying something that's offensive. It might be a person at the grocery store who's being disrespectful to someone right in front of you. It might be any opportunity that you have to speak up and give voice to someone who has been beaten down, who is tired, who has just said, I'm done, I'm tired, I'm just gonna go along with it. Because the only way that we will start to see change is if we have intentional disruption. It's an intentional disruption that brings about change, and so we have to be uncomfortable with the things that we are seeing. And I think that notion of comfort is a hugely important one because I think we as a community have a very high polite norm, right? And we don't want anyone ever to be uncomfortable. And I think there's a major difference between politeness and respect. And I think we need to be respectful going in into the discomfort. Um, sort of teeing off of that, I think there are some of us in the arts generally and in the orchestra world who use the frame of outreach. And I personally find that a somewhat problematic frame to use. And the person who actually helped me understand this was Newt Gingrich. And he was speaking <laughs> after the last election and he said the Republicans are gonna focus very much on outreach. And what they mean by that is the same three old white men are gonna sit at the table and make the same decisions. And then they're gonna worry about why everyone else in the world isn't falling in love with what they're deciding, right? So I wanna return Marin and Alex and, and Ann and Gail to that question that, that we sort of began in the opening plenary with what are we never gonna change and what are the things that we have to change, right? And I think we're at a moment in the orchestra world, given the numbers, 4.2% of musicians are African-American Latino, that I think many of us think, okay, the orchestra is great, it's not broken, it works, we just have to change the colors of the faces that are on stage and everything else will remain the same. And that's not change and that's not the discomfort that we need to get to. So let me sort of bring in the notion of, of power to that and sort of say, Marin, as a music director, what do you have the power to change and what are some of the things that you're thinking need to change in the Baltimore Symphony when you get back to your office on Monday? What are, what are some of the things that need to change and be different other than the color of the people showing up? Um, I think, uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I guess I, I, look at, I look at my role as an, uh, a very privileged ambassador um, uh, for, for classical music, and um, I, I feel empowered by this um, conference, and I feel validated in many ways by this conference. Uh, and I also am very appreciative because I think my musicians felt extremely um, appreciated 
uh, I think you heard them play last night and you could see how incredibly wonderful they are. But I think they also um, understood your appreciation for all of our efforts, you know, in our small way, what we're trying to do for the next generations, what we're trying to do in the moment. And that helps me, um, it goes a long way for me uh, with, with the musicians because I'm, you know, conducting is really just a metaphor for this whole conversation because I can only achieve what everyone will allow me to achieve. Um, I don't make any of the sound. I'm just trying to create an environment where people can be the best they can be. And that's really the kind of citizen of the world I want to be as well. But what I would say is that I feel encouraged to continue on. The power lies with the people that take action. And you just have to keep moving forward and take action. Just continue to take action no matter what. I, I believe if you believe that it's the right thing and speak up and be open. And now that we started the dialogue, the thing is I, I think we should make a commitment. I know this sounds really silly, but I think we should talk about the problem of race in our institutions on every level every day. Mm. If we spoke about it every day, just even, even if we just decide, okay, this is our timer for 10 minutes, we're gonna talk about this. But the problem is we stuff it on the side and we'll get to that and you never get to it, you know? So can I so do that? I didn't can, answer can your I, question no, you at did. all, right? Well, yeah. and I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, set aside my high polite norm for a second. Are you willing to make a commitment to talk, to, to talk about race at the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra oh, sure. on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday this week? Uh, on Monday, I might not go in, but I, I will talk about it. <laughs> Tuesday through Friday. I promise Tuesday through, actually, <laughs> Tuesday through Sunday, I'll talk about it, so I'll make up for Tuesday Monday. Tuesday through Sunday. Okay. I'm going to rest on Monday. Tuesday through Sunday. Excellent. Yes. Every, right. I will, for right. sure. Right. Right. I love that. Look Seven out, days everybody. you have Here to rest go. on the seventh, yeah. right? They, no, that's God. He just thinks he's a conductor. Um, <laughs> Alex, um, same question. You, you use this metaphor about um, musicians as hams. Mm -hmm. Sitting in a principal chair in the orchestra, how much do you have the ability to change? And this isn't a question about Phoenix. This is a question about musicians in orchestras. How do you have to think about leading institutional change as a musician? Hmm. Um, so let me get there yeah. in a roundabout way. Um, so you, you, you started this off sort of framing things about, you know, it can't just be about changing who's on the stage and not doing anything differently. And I agree with that. I do think that who's on stage matters, right? Because the stage is our storefront window. It's um, our most outward facing um, facet of our organization and it's how we tell a story about what this is about and who it's for. I'm a terrible golfer, the worst, but I wouldn't be a golfer at all, honestly, if it weren't for Tiger Woods, <laughs> yeah. right? I saw someone doing it and I could sort of project myself into that. And uh, so I think it matters who's on stage, but to your point, um, changing who's on stage doesn't change our structure. It doesn't change our viewpoint necessarily. It doesn't change our philosophy. Um, so uh, I think that in order to, um, I think our culture is in, in orchestras, our culture is informed by our structure. And we complain and talk a lot about the culture of orchestras, but it's informed by the structure. I think that in order to, I think one way we might investigate um, changing both the structure and the culture would be to create some unstructured spaces, right, in which um, various constituent groups could come together to work on a project that might be creating a new donor experience involving music, or it might be creating a new concert, or it might be creating any number of things, but by putting people in different roles and giving them the opportunity to be creative and imaginative, that might give us some view of a future culture and a future structure, and that might give us both the inspiration and the inclination to um, change the structure that we have. Because getting to your question, as a musician, principal musician at that with a title, which you know can sometimes mean something. Um, what can I change? Not, not a whole lot. And I've been working hard at my organization since uh, I've been tenured. I've served on every committee. Um, uh, 
uh, artistic advisory orchestra committee during a very tough period. Just finished up uh, serving on the negotiation committee for my second was ne negotiation committee for my second round. But the structure of orchestra is is what it is, and I I do believe that it's structured so that um, the musicians are the hands of the organization, and other people are the brains of the organization. And we need both hands and brains, right? I'm not saying that there is anything um, inherently wrong with that, but that does have some inherent um, implications. So, um, you know, I have been, uh, that doesn't mean that I've been incapable of making change at the Phoenix Symphony, positive change, I hope, and being a, a positive, contributing citizen of my orchestra. But I will say that, you know, in this sphere, um, some of the most important and the most important work that I do, uh, I do outside the orchestra. Um, I started a small <coughs> after school program because I had a little bit of fear of missing out of all the stuff that I saw happening around the country, most notably in Baltimore. At, in Baltimore. Right, so I started a little program, and our first ensemble was a little bucket band. Excellent, very good. And um, that's something I had to do uh, on my own. I tried to engage other people uh, in various positions, not only in my organization. Um, to you know, it didn't occur to me that, that this was something that I was going to have to do. I don't know that I necessarily saw myself as someone who would start something. I, in fact, was really avoiding that um, because that's hard and intimidating. I didn't think I knew how to do that. And I didn't think that made sense, honestly, because there's a lot of structures out there that, I, that would sort of cut out a whole bunch of me learning how to do stuff that's taken me a long time to do maybe half as well as someone who already knew how to do it, right? Um, but ultimately, that's what had to happen. And, um, you know, that's work that doesn't happen within my orchestra. Do we have colleagues from Phoenix here? Are there any of the Phoenix colleagues in the room? No. No, not yet. They left. Um, Will you go back and invite your colleagues again to collaborate with you on the Bucket Band? Uh, I don't know if I'll invite them to collaborate on, on, on this, because this thing's already up and going. But if they, if they, if they, if they want to, you know, I don't know about this, because this is Will you invite having... them to collaborate on something? Yeah. A non-hierarchical collaboration, will you extend uh, that invitation? Yeah, and, that I, and, yeah, and I'll, listen, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, first off, I work for a great organization, right? Love it. This is all. This is all. This is this is but about what needs that, to change, no, not about what's that, working well. Right, right, Absolutely. Right. We, we um, I'm, I'm working collaboratively within the organization as part of this contract that we just settled. We're going to be engaging. Uh, we got language in our contract that compels us to every no less frequently than every five years to engage in some uh, organization-wide artistic visioning. Um, the first of those uh, sequences will start next year. I'll be working with that. I'm excited by the opportunity to work in collaboration towards the betterment of our orchestra. Um, so, but yeah, sure, if, 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 if the organization says, hey, we want to do something with kids and music and hands-on, and we think maybe, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm down, absolutely. And you were, um, you and I have known each other a long time, so I'm going to treat you as an old friend. Um, <laughs> You were pushing for more short declarative answers throughout the conference. You wanted people to speak more plainly, more succinctly. Uh, and so I'm going to try and be my best of a political reporter. What is something that needs to be different tomorrow at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra that existed yesterday? What is something that needs to change in order for you to take another step forward? That's a great question. Um, I was going to read to you the vision statement that our diversity task force came up with after meeting for a year, I think. And I want to read it because I want to get every word right. And so it leads to the answer to your question. Our vision statement, which we put out at our annual meeting that year, is that the DSO aspires to be an inclusive and culturally relevant community where all people can experience their world through music. So what I can do going back to the Detroit Symphony Orchestra tonight, <laughs> tomorrow, the next day, is that this isn't, a, this isn't a vision statement that we then put by the telephone or put on our wall or put in our drawer. This is a vision statement that we aspire to every day in everything we do. And I think that, um, values-based organizations that are driven by their values and have aspirations and visions do guide their actions every day by those visions, except we get busy and we have a lot of urgent issues and everyone's a good person, but we don't always keep our eye on the ball. 
So I can go back and say that we are going to live and breathe the aspiration to serve this vision in everything we do and think about all the people that we aim to serve and being an orchestra, being a community in our community with our communities that live in our midst. And we do aspire to accessibility. Everyone knows that's our platform. We chose accessibility because it meant openness and welcoming people in and also going to people. We have so much more to do, and I'm just going to pledge that we will continue to put one foot in front of the other and continue to do more and do new every day. Hmm. I'm going to let you off the hook on that in the interest of time. Um, <laughs> Gail, you've set concrete goals mm -hmm. for yourself. You're holding yourself accountable to 40% representation from African American Thank trustees. You. When you think about your CEO um, of your orchestra, when you think about the leadership team, how do these issues come into play in their job descriptions and in their performance evaluations? Are there measurements in place? Are there ways that you are let, concretely holding folks accountable? Let me say something that that was my personal declaration, and mm -hmm. I don't think it's fair to the organization because we really haven't adopted that. But because the league then came out with this topic and it was in a magazine where I, I really made a declarative statement and a goal that wasn't necessarily shared among the, the current legacy board of the Memphis Symphony, you really helped by publishing that and, and it, was, it set uh, the agenda that I was trying to create as more normative or, or aspiring in our industry and that became, the goal that I had set became more acceptable, but we have a lot of work to do. It just I, And I agree about the structure and I wanted to mention this, on the board level, the way we're being uh, successful at attracting African American leadership is to look at our organization in three spheres. The legacy sphere, and some people don't like that term, but it is really what we've always been producing concerts on stage. And that is where the traditional board leadership is, and frankly, a lot of the money still is. So we, I had to figure out how do you keep that sphere engaged and at the table. Then we created an education sphere, and we've invited our, and we made a vice chair of education who happens to be our former superintendent of schools in Memphis that was a superintendent of schools in Boston. Those group of leaders that have a voice at the board level, at the governance level of our organization, care about equity in education and access and, and they don't necessarily have the same level of passion for the canon and for the legacy, that the legacy sphere. The third sphere that we have is diversity and inclusion, and we have a vice chair of diversity and inclusion who is an African-American leader at a large corporation leading diversity and inclusion in that corporation. There is a whole circle of leaders that care about that. The center intersection we drew a heart, and that is because there has to be something that draws us all together, and that is the transformative power of music. We don't say the transformative power of the canon, because, but we say that we believe in the transformative power of music, and then throughout each of those spheres, it, it infuses it. That's how we've been successful at attracting more leadership into our Yeah, Alex. So on this movement, right, from diversity to inclusion, you know, just because we haven't figured out, and in you and in, in your orchestra, just because you haven't figured out the diversity piece yet, doesn't mean that you can't start to work on a structure that would allow for inclusion, especially as it relates to what's happening on the stage. And I think you could find some really excited and willing partners among your musicians who are maybe eager for opportunities to express their creativity, their entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship, actually, if you can get them before, before, before they actually get out there and start expressing it as entrepreneurship. So I think there are opportunities right now to start the work of preparing organizations that can be um, inclusive in their structure and their design as it relates to power and direction before they are yet diverse. Thank you. Um, Jeray and Monique, both of you have talked about 
getting started on solutions is hard. It's gotten to be relatively easy to start talking about the problem and framing the problem endlessly. I think we've got a majority of folks in this room, at least a significant plurality of folks in this room, that are ready to do something, but I don't know that everyone knows exactly what they should do. If folks want to get over framing the problem and begin taking action, actually having the conversation about structural racism, actually having the conversation about what needs to be different, what is a resource, what is an organization, what is something that folks can actually do to take action and make a change? So, uh, from, I do believe, again, that uh, I think most people get the problem around diversity. Like, right. I think people get it. I think that we can continue to help people understand like how it impacts their day to day, how it impacts their institutions. But I think people generally are like, like, okay, there's a problem. I think about with us in the police, again, in August of 2014, people did not across the country think there was a problem. Now people do. Uh, I do think when I think about solutions, there's a question like, what, what would you do if you weren't afraid, right? Like, what would you do if, if like you knew that it, when you come out on the other side, okay, if there was no risk involved, what would that look like? And, I, and pushing people to think about that world and at least put those out somewhere and like start from there. I think that most people know how, if they could control all things, how they would bring the world into be. Uh, and there's like a part of fear that like works in that space for people. So I think about like you said you want 40% of the board, like that, that in some cities is a risky thing to say in public, right? Like that is gonna be a loss of money, people are gonna back out, they don't wanna participate in an institution where leadership says that, and like are you willing to do that? You might not be, but again, that is like what solutions look like. And for me, the question about like what should people do is, one is are people, are we willing to invest as much time talking about what solutions could be as we do invest in talking about what the problem is, I think that that is like a real question. And then it's like the messy work of just like putting the problem, putting the solutions out there and then trying to figure out what's the best context. For us, you know, we were in the middle of the street. We had no clue what we were doing. We weren't protesters. We were like people who knew that Mike Brown should be alive. Like that was who we are in the beginning. But the crisis for us was so visceral that we had to figure out solutions. Like we immediately had to say, we're gonna be here, we're gonna be, and then we figured it out in the end, but it was a lot of trial and error around like, here's what we think the world should look like and here's how we're gonna press. And I would push you to think about like you, I would push you to say like, you know what some solution should look like and like put those around the people that you care about and that you trust and then like start from there. That's what organizing is. Organizers are people who say the world can be better, I think here's how it can be better, let me find people who agree. Like there's nothing mystical and magical about that. Like that is how all of this work begins. That's great, Monique. I'm gonna put a huge weight on your shoulders and give you the last word of this panel. Oh. Wow. So when you're thinking about action, when you're thinking about getting started, when you're thinking about a concrete step, what are one or two things you want folks to carry with them out of this room? Great, and thank you for that honor of having the last word. So thank you, Jamie, first off, for pushing us even on the panel um, I think that you, you've seen how we ourselves are struggling with what the next step is. So thank you for helping us to, to get into that space. I remember a time when I was, um, I was leading a session and a woman stood up and said, you know, the problems in education are so overwhelming. How will we ever know when we've accomplished the goal? And I said, for me, it means that we would no longer be able to pr predict student outcomes by race, ethnicity, income status, language ability, that I would no longer be able to look at those demographics and say, this is how you're going to perform, or this is your lot in life. So for me, that's what achieving the goal means. I wanna to say to each and every one of you in this room that don't forget how important this system is. This is an elite picture the top of the music chain when we're talking about orchestras. This is not um, some common aspect of life. Don't ever forget the importance and the space that you occupy. And so when we think about the influence that we can have at any point in that system, it's important to realize that this is not ordinary, this is not common, this is something special. And you are something special because of your representation in that. And so what I guess I would, I would offer and I would say to the group in terms of solutions is that you first have to articulate the vision of change that you wanna see. If you wanna be able to have more awareness throughout the system about the problems, then it's a commitment to raising awareness. If you wanna make sure that there's more diversity in the representation of musicians and leaders that are at the table, then it's a commitment to hiring. 
if you want to make sure that more of the resources that you're doing um, to support communities in your area go towards supporting kids and youth and those communities, that's the goal. But you have to have a vision for change. And so I think the first action step is being able to directly articulate what is that vision for change that I want to see come about, and then start to each and every day work towards that vision for change. I think that you have to plan to the horizon that you can see. So, you know, I would love to say to eradicate racism in our nation by 2020. It's great, right? Okay, cool. I'll set that as a goal. But I can only plan to the horizon that I can see, and so I can go so far, and then when I get there, there might be other challenges or things that I need to address, and then I need to regroup or remodify or rechange what I'm doing, and then keep going. But you need to plan to the horizon you can see, but you have to have a vision for change. The other and the last thing that I would say is that um, what we know about behavior and patterns is that it takes at least, I think, 32 times to do something before it becomes a habit or be before it becomes routine. And so if you think about anything, if it's like, you know, brushing your teeth or washing clothes or washing the car or cleaning the house, um, 32 times before it becomes something that's, um, that's routine and you don't have to think about doing that. So just think about that within itself. If it means having 32 conversations about race before it becomes comfortable and habit and routine, then that's what you should make the commitment around. But there has to be a vision and a commitment to making that change. And so that's, that's what I would say in terms of the, the direct action steps. And I don't want anyone to ever leave this room thinking that from my position, I have no opportunity to influence change because you do each and every single day. And sometimes it's just a matter of saying to the person who's making the decisions, hey, have you thought about this? Were you aware of that? What about this? And so um, I guess what I would say, since I have the closing word, is that it is your absolute responsibility because you occupy the spaces that you do to make a change and to make a difference. I love that. And I think that's a perfect challenge for us as we walk out. Think about whether you're willing to go home and commit to 32 conversations about race. Think about if that's something that you can do to make it a habit within yourself and within your organization. And feel free to, if you're willing to make that commitment, feel free to tweet it at the league at Orc16. Feel free to check in about that because I think that's a really powerful thing. So hold your applause for two seconds because I just want to make sure we thank everyone here. Um, please join me in thanking Gail, Anne, Alex, Marin, Monique, and DeRay for this really fabulous conversation. And Jesse's going to take us home. Thank you guys so much. So some pieces have two codas. Um, usually the second one's shorter than the first. Um, so it's been quite a journey we've been on. Those of us who were here on Wednesday who went to West Baltimore to uh, see or kids in action, uh, right up through uh, unbelievable uh, comments this afternoon from Congressman Cummings and everything in between. And uh, for some of us whose hair is gray and white like mine, the journey's been, been longer. And uh, I'm reminded that in 1992, following two years of conversations with its members, the League published a report that said, among other things, that orchestras had to come to grips with the reality of race in America and the absence of diversity on its stages. The leadership in our field instructed the League to stop disseminating the report. It was considered to be so threatening to our industry for its association to say out loud the things that everybody knew. Up until a few years ago, uh, we, we gave up having sessions on diversity because every time we had a session with diversity in the title, nobody came. So we had to disguise it and talk about diversity under other, other banners. So um, we've come a long way and it's a really terrific thing and we should feel really encouraged that, um, you know, the progress that we've made um, and also uh, next time the League suggests that the field pay attention to something, we shouldn't wait 25 years to wake up and pay attention. What? <laughs> well, 
but once in a while we get it right. So, um, you know, there, there's no simple way to uh, pull together all the strands of everything we've heard in the last few days. Um, but just a, a couple of thoughts and a couple of uh, comments to share that we've picked up over the, over the four days we've been together. And um, l let me start with some of the things that, that, that uh, have resonated. Um, one from this morning, uh, even Kansas is not Kansas anymore. <laughs> yeah, think about that. Um, we can both have a cannon and redefine it at the same time. Changing the pipeline won't work if we don't also change our institutions. An investment in the other is an investment in you. Who is on the stage tells the story of who we are. This is a long-term effort, don't quit. This one has nothing to do with diversity, but it was really hilarious when it came up. Um, balancing, uh, we, we can balance our budget and still go out of business. So those of you with unfunded pension liabilities, you know what that's about. Um, when you are being proactive, you are always right, even when you're wrong. And let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, um, change happens in the nitty gritty. And art is a mirror and a window. And um, I think the most powerful one that we heard came earlier this afternoon from Congressman Cummings, that diversity is not a problem, it's a promise. And I think that's really the the feeling we should probably all go home with. And one of the things that I think this conference has borne out is that when you change who's in the room, who's in the conversation, you get very different results. And we've never had a conference before with this kind of diversity, with this kind of, of divergence of perspective that helped, um, helped us be a better the league, be a better mirror uh, for all of you to see ourselves differently and consider our possibilities in new and different ways. And with all of the challenges about how we go forward and what does it mean to act, um, one really critical piece of acting is to begin talking with others, bring others into the conversations, essential piece of moving forward. So um, as we think about moving forward, we will be in Detroit next year. I can't imagine having had this conference that we can ever have a conference again that doesn't bring into our conversations the life of a city uh, that's hosting our conference and all of the currents running through their streams. And the De Detroit Symphony has put together uh, a little video that's going to give a quick preview of what that conference is going to look like. So whoever's got their fingers, go. Good. This city, she is rising. People creating beautiful things every day. amount of pride. You can see it. You can feel it. You can hear it. One of the thrills of being a Detroiter is sharing our city with people visiting for the first time. Detroit welcomes you to the 2017 League of American Orchestras Conference. So I know I'm no stranger to all of you. Ann Parsons, the president and CEO of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. And we just want to welcome you to Detroit. Um, 
Who's coming? Everybody coming? Right? Uh, we, we pledge today uh, to go deeper, to celebrate what's working, to, to, to pull together the threads of what's working, to bring new people to the table, to collaborate and to celebrate and to learn and to grow. And that's what these conferences do for us. And we want to thank, and I want to thank right now, the American Symphony, sorry. Whoops. <laughs> the League of American Orchestras for everything you do for us as an industry. You serve us, you support us, you push us, you pull us. Let's uh, thank the League of American Orchestras for the conference. Uh, for a long time, people have been afraid of Detroit, and I'm only here to tell you, as someone who just moved into the city of Detroit, it's an awesome place to be. We welcome you to explore our great city. We hope you come home and um, feel as we do that it's a, one of the great places in America because anything is possible there, and we every day push ourselves to believing in what is new that can happen. And so we hope to inspire you, learn from you, welcome you, and um, we thank you for signing up right now and helping us design a conference that is not going to be better than this conference. It will just be different. And we thank everybody here. Marin, you're amazing. Paul, um, the board, everybody. You've done uh, such a great service by welcoming us and giving us such a great time. So thank the Baltimore Symphony and, uh, and all of you. And I don't think I have the last word, so I'm going to give this back to Jesse. Come to Detroit. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Okay, so now we, we really are down to the final, final moments. Oh yeah. So um, here's an action you can take right away. We we moved our uh, donor uh, table right right outside the door over there. So so you can't miss it. And remember, you have a chance of winning a an iPad, an iPad Pro, 128 gigs. So uh, don't bypass us. And um, oh, and so thank you. Uh, thank you to all uh, of the volunteers from the B Baltimore Symphony uh, who've helped us on the ground here, the volunteers of all your organizations, our own volunteer council, uh, without whom none of our work could go forward, and uh, again to everyone associated with the Baltimore Symphony and to each of you for continuing to make music possible in your communities. We're ever grateful. Thank you. Have safe trips home. Bye-bye.